Florence. So uh, thank you, Richard. I'm, I'm a little bit anxious um, speaking to you because I never speak without slides, which is only because I can prepare and know exactly what I'm going to say. And, um, and now I'm not as prepared and don't know exactly what I'm going to say. Um, but I was asked also to talk about something that I don't typically talk about, which is my own um, sort of arc of developing uh, the thought that I've developed. Like, where, how did I get to the particular focus that I'm focusing on today? And I'm happy to get to that last part because I have enormous respect for what I call the high-functioning democracy that's represented here. And I'm spending a great deal of my time now trying to convince my colleagues in the United States of the character of the low-functioning democracy that I think the United States is. Um, um, and so let me get to that story a little bit by passing through the work that was directly related to copyright and the internet. Um, so my, I guess if, if, I have, if I've had the careers, I've, I've, I've gone through three careers in my academic work. The first was about constitutional theory. And I did a lot of work in the former Soviet republics and in Eastern Europe after the change in 1989. Um, and the basic question was, how do you construct a constitutional tradition out of the tradition of Soviet thinking and communist thinking. Um, and Americans at that time had this very naive view about what constitutional law was. They thought it was <coughs> a text. So you had an extraordinary number of scholars and rogues traveling to Eastern European countries writing constitutions with the idea that, you know, if you just had the right words in a constitution and just imposed it in a country, you would instantly have democratic government. Um, but of course, what very quickly people recognized was that in addition to the text, the law of a constitution, um, there's a whole set of norms that are essential to make the constitution function. So the problem in the Soviet Union wasn't that they didn't have legislatures or presidents or courts. They had legislatures, presidents, and courts. They just didn't have the social meaning associated with a legislature or a president or a court, in particular a court that would think of itself as a entity whose job it is to resist the power of uh, the government. Instead, the courts thought their power was to encourage, their job was to encourage or to extend the power of the government. So it was a process of changing the norms that governed uh, in those cultures that was so essential to getting to the place that we might actually build um, constitutional, uh, constitutional traditions. Um, so then, early in the 1990s, I started being obsessed with the internet, or the emerging internet. Um, and the reason initially was, I found that people's politics in the context of the internet were unpredictable. So conservatives didn't know what the conservative move was, and liberals didn't know what the liberal move was. And as a teacher, having an opportunity to teach a subject where the students aren't immediately aligned according to their baseline politics was enormously uh, in, uh, exciting because, of course, it's boring to be teaching and the liberals know exactly what they're supposed to say and the conservatives know exactly what they're supposed to say. So for me, it was a pedagogical opportunity. But what I quickly recognized is in thinking about the law of cyberspace, there was a similar insight to the point that I had recognized about constitutional law in the former Soviet republics. Um, that part of what constituted the regulatory um, character of the space was not necessarily the text of laws that might be governing or even the norms of people who might be living within the space. Essential to the understanding of the normative regime of the space was to understand the architecture of the space, the technical infrastructure within which people lived or operated, right? the technical infrastructure that the internet was defining. This technical infrastructure, what I called the code, enabled certain freedoms, imposed certain constraints. So it enabled the freedom of the first version of the internet to live relatively anonymously, to do things relatively anonymously, um, to, not, to make it possible to engage in activities without anybody knowing who you are, where you're coming from, or what you're doing. And if you think about the essential components of regulation, typically in order to regulate effectively, you've got to know who someone is, where they're coming from, and what they're doing. Right? That's what you need to know to know who's doing something wrong and who to punish. But the internet erased those essential characters of, of regulation early on. And this came not from 
a legal determination or even norms of the space, but from the architecture of the space. So in thinking about, in sort of, sort of say, the modalities of regulation, we had law and norms, the thing I learned so strongly in Eastern Europe, but now code was a component of this modalities of regulation. And so when you think three modalities of regulation, there's got to be more than three, so I added in that mix um, markets as well as a kind of regulator. Um, and this was the framework that I uh, tried to introduce in the first book I wrote about the law of cyberspace, which was titled Code and Other Laws of Cyberspace, to emphasize the sense in which the regulation of cyberspace was the conjunction of these four modalities, law, norms, code, and markets. Um, so think about a particular example, uh, privacy. When the Internet's first out there, as I said, basically because of the way the architecture was specified, you could engage in behavior without anybody knowing anything about who you were. So you could go to a website, view the website. The website would not know who you were or where you came from. If you bought 500 copies of my book on the, on the website and then changed to a different page and then came back to the first page, it wouldn't know you were the person that was on the first page. So you would lose the 500 copies of the books that you purchased. So it gave you privacy, but the original architecture made it, made it hard for commerce to work because commerce couldn't actually identify the people it was trying to sell things to. Okay, so very early on, cookies was devised as a technology or an innovation to this architecture. Cookies, which were basically little data files deposited on your hard drive, that made it possible for the website to now know you were the person that was just on that web page. Okay, so there's a tiny change in code, but the consequence of this change in code is an enormous facility for websites to begin to monitor <coughs> who people are or where they come from or what they're doing as they, as they search on the web. Um, and so this tiny change of code from this perspective pretty radically changed the privacy that was effectively delivered by the internet. Um, it wasn't any change in law. Nobody even thought about how to make laws there. And norms were pretty ambiguous. But it was a simple change in the technical infrastructure that radically changed the ability of the space to protect or to give privacy. And on the other side, radically changed the ability of the space to make commerce possible. Because now, because of cookies, it was, it was increasingly uh, possible for websites to develop business models that turned upon the ability to advertise to people who had certain interests, the ability to um, create relationships and accounts with people of certain kind of interests. So the whole growth of commerce on the net turned upon this little technical innovation. Um, but the technical innovation had something it gave us, commerce, something it took away, this relative anonymity. Um, so the point about this way of thinking about the law of cyberspace is that regulators need constantly to think about the trade-off among these modalities. So if you want to achieve more privacy in the internet, what's the way to do it? More laws, efforts to sort of get norms changed, regulations that try to change the infrastructure of the net itself, or regulations that try to change the economic incentives of players on the net. And the, and the objective of regulation must be to make the trade-offs among those four. Now, obviously, this is not a point limited to cyberspace, right? So if you're a government and you're trying to eliminate smoking or reduce smoking in a society, which in, from my perspective is a great thing, we should work hard at doing that. Um, having lived in California now, of course, I am an a, a anti-smoking fascist, so I uh, celebrate efforts by governments to eliminate smoking. Um, so the government, in eliminating smoking, sort of makes a choice. He says, okay, we could have laws that say you're not allowed to smoke in certain places, or you have to be 18 years old to smoke. Or we could have norms. So in California, we had extraordinary propaganda that tried to stigmatize smokers you know, as weak people or sick people or pathetic people. Right? So they're stigmatizing as an effort to increase the cost of smoking. Or there's markets. We can tax cigarettes. Of course, in the United States, we subsidize tobacco production at the same time. But you know, the idea is to raise the price of cigarettes, so that increases the constraint on norms. Or we can change the architecture of cigarettes. So the FDA, under David Kessler, for a while framed, recharacterized cigarettes as a drug delivery device, which meant that the Federal uh, Food and Drug Administration was permitted to regulate the content of the cigarettes. And so the content included nicotine. And so the idea was, we will reduce the nicotine carried in a cigarette so as to reduce the addictiveness of the cigarette. So, so the point is there, too, in real space, we have this trade-off among these four modalities of regulation. And every regulator needs to think about those trade-offs to figure out what's the most efficient mix to achieve a regulatory objective. But the point is, in cyberspace, 
the architecture component or the code component is much more salient, much more frequently the target of what regulators need to do than in real space. And real space architecture is pretty um, uh, not as plastic, not as usable. Um, okay, so that was all, all of that work was extremely academic as it sounds, kind of boring, extremely academic. Um, but uh, in 1998, um, Congress passed the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act. 